The first Chinese public garden was born in the year 2000 in the Pearl River Delta. Located in Zongshan, bordered by skyscrapers, this garden is a real curiosity as it deviates wildly from the codes of the traditional Chinese garden. Among the ruined structures of the city's great shipyard, which went bankrupt in the 1990s, wild outbreaks of greenery have sprung up, reminiscent of the countryside. A curious green lung along the lines of the rehabilitated brownfields in Germany and the United States. In a China where the cities are often engulfed by a thick cloud of pollution, it's an exceptional project. This is the green team which transformed these 12 hectares into an astonishing space. There's Madame Ma, head gardener, the respectable functionary, Mr. He, the indispensable architect, Pang Wei, and above all, our chief landscaper, Kong Jian Yu, otherwise known as Dr. Yu. I try to express my concept to consider every day as monumental. So in this park, I try to, to give individuals uh, have their space. Among the orange beams, the scarlet sheds, regulars invade this space daily to turn it into a fantastic playground. And it's from the eastern entrance to the park, amidst the staggered terraces, in a clutter of bamboo and lotus, that Dr. Yu contemplates his work. I still remember the first time I came here. It was muddy, dirty. Uh, the building is falling apart. It's rustic, depressing setting. A garbage dump, a brown field. No one liked it. So they wanted to demolish everything. So I want to clean up. But I immediately notice the value underneath, the potential, the pond, the water, the water itself. So I want to protect the water, keep the water. And the trees, you have uh, banyan trees, you have, you have uh, palm trees, you have all these uh, uh, sequoia trees. All trees were here before. And those ugly, dirty structure we can clean it up, clean it up and, and really can, be, can discover the beauty underneath. And the, the tower, the water tower, is, un, is just under destruction at that time. So I was able to stop that. I stopped, I said, no, please keep those things, you know. So it takes uh, three strategy, preserve. To preserve those things which I think should be uh, a really representative of the site, the spirit of the site. And second, it's to reuse, to reuse those things. And uh, finally, you want to recycle it. So recycle means you ground everything together to invent something new, like the pave we recycle the steel to create the pave. So the pave also reflects the, 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 the essence of the site. So it, it tells the story of the site. It was a new language, which, which is my own language. And actually the design of this park also inspired my own childhood experience. Why well, I want to draw my own village. The big trees, the bigger comfort trees. The terraces, the waterfront. I raise buffaloes. I cultivate uh, rice paddies.
Dr. Yu is a farmer's son. As a child, this little boy from Zhejiang would walk around 10 kilometers across rice paddies every morning to get to school in time. His determination then drove him to study in Beijing, then in the USA at the prestigious Harvard University. When he returned to China in the early 2000s, he set up his own architectural firm. His goal was to rehabilitate the landscapes of his childhood in the heart of the city by combining ecology and inventiveness. I came back to China in 1996 when I saw that all the beauty had been destroyed. Under the name of flood control, people channelized the river, they built high dikes, high dams. They excavate the sand, you know, for urbanization, for building, for building materials. And under the name of uh, beauty, to transform the, the natural river into flower beds, you know, into ornamental garden, into concrete, into marble stone. Now, so I just feel so ugly, just in five years. Boasting some 15 megacities of more than 10 million inhabitants, China has built giant infrastructures, but only at the price of disastrous ecological consequences. This park offers a model of how recycling can transform a city into a functional ecosystem. This park is my first idea about how you can design in the city that is safe for people to use, usable for people, but at the same time, adapt to nature. So a designer for, for this park, actually I use this uh, framing approach. Just by frame it, then the nature come out, pump out, ah, and the meaning come out. A reinterpretation of the natural and cultural system of the, of the site. Another actor has played an important role alongside Dr. Yu. Mr. Pang Wei. For 16 years, the architect had been talking to Dr. Yu about developing this former site as a tribute to the 1,300 people who worked here. So here and there along the paths of the park, you come upon metal statues of workers, repainted machines, and Pang hanging from the skeleton of the old docks, colored anti-rust. The first time we visited this place, we were very touched by the intrinsic atmosphere of this place. These old industrial buildings, traces left by decades of production and shipbuilding, the slogans, the placards. Here, we have had to make sure that the old things, the living things, and the new things that we've created together form a force of global creation. Here, we must speak of a Western architect, Louis Kahn. He had a phrase. He'd say, each material, each form of matter has an aspiration. Steel, for instance. What does steel do? We've continually tried to understand the language of steel. The beauty is in the machines themselves. The beauty is in the industrial language, 
The beauty is in shipbuilding. With a view to preserving part of the old structures, we have produced a new design and brought new creativity to bear to complete a public environmental work where ancient meets modern. In fact, the whole park is a pay-in to strength and simplicity, to man and machine. Facing the orange dock, this time in a red cube, we find references to the old shipyard. From this recycled steel painted vermilion came the idea of comparing two cultural revolutions, that of Mao, founder of the People's Republic of China, and that of Dr. Yu, which shakes up but repairs a landscape. We want to make the, the box as a storyteller, tell the stories. So I decided to put water inside it to create a reflection pond, create a really a very religious space, very quiet to, to sit there, to, to think, to think about the past, about how cultural evolution can happen, how it's so brutal, how human can be so brutal. So it's a box, very shiny, modern, contemporary box, putting a setting which is very messy, very natural, very native. So you create contrast, the green, the red, the messy and the clean. I tried to tell the story of the red culture of this side, of this park, but also about China and through my own experience. The box is nine meter by nine meter. The workers, they live together in the dormitory. So I basically use this size. And this size also reflect my own experience. During cultural revolution, my family, the local landlord families, been packed in this box. Everybody in the same room and surrounded. It's a steel box. It's a, there's no way out. So that's one way I cut, very straight cut. It's industrial, brutal, straight, hard, not, not negotiable. With this red Mao cube, not only is Dr. Yu serving up a slice of history that no one here dare speak of, but his transgression is amplified when he decides to put a railway in the center of the park across the entire site. Unprecedented in the art of the Chinese garden, which is mainly defined by a decorum of little bridges, running water, pavilions, golden towers, and ornamental plants. The railroad track has never been used before in, in the Chinese garden. It's certainly against the Chinese garden. People think it's ugly, people think it's industrial. I was educated during my college as a landscape gardener, never do something straight, okay? You have to do meandering, you know, people work meandering. You know, Chinese have two, about 2,000 years of foot bending. They bend the feet, they have work here meandering, they never go sit straight every day. We have to be elegant. Straight is considered to be enemy of the Chinese beauty garden. At Harvard, I was educated to be ecological, contemporary, modern art, contemporary art. So here you will see the new aesthetics. I call it big feet aesthetics. China will have 5,000 years history. We treat it uh, the Tiananmen, the emperors, uh, tombs, the forbidden city, and all these ancient traditions, the beautiful tradition. And the Suzhou garden, you know, all these uh, traditional garden. Uh, but those are very elite, very high class. My farming experience, my village experience tell me that 
Big feet can be beautiful, productive is beautiful, elastic is beautiful, you know, tall grass is beautiful. So you didn't see ornamental flowers here because I rejected at the beginning. He preferred the quivering of local herbs to the flatness of horticultural plants frequently used in Asian cities. A different landscape that requires only minimal yet judicious intervention from gardeners. At certain spots, the vegetation grows anarchically. We let it express itself. If we get weeds growing and threatening the other plants, we deal with them. But under normal circumstances, we try to keep all human intervention to a strict minimum. We often look upon plants as tools or ornaments, not as our life partners. In this project, we've let the plants return to a natural, lively state so they can rekindle a relationship with Mother Earth. We hope that these plants give the whole place a temporal feeling of the past. Many of our seeds come from Mount Wugui. We went to gather them ourselves. In our garden, you can see banyans all over the place, but especially on the Eco Island. This part of the park has been set aside since its conception to preserve 20, 50-year-old banyans. You could call them living cultural relics. The banyan is a relative of the fig, a symbolic tree in southern China. It grows fast here and is well suited to its environment. Sometimes in the spring, in one group of banyans, you can simultaneously observe the passage of the four seasons. On some trees, new leaves have just grown. On others, the leaves are still green. Some have started to lose leaves, while others have lost them completely. It's very original and quite beautiful. In terms of the park's vegetation, it was very difficult to get all our ideas accepted. Our suggestions led to violent conflict. Today, this project doesn't seem too avant-garde or ahead of its time, but back then, setting it up was extremely hard. Our main worry was whether people would agree to come and stroll in such a different park at their leisure time. Back then, we really did wonder about that. Monsieur A, former deputy director of the city of Zhongshan Planning Bureau, witnessed the development of Dr. Yu's project at the time. And it came close to running onto the rocks. Uh, controversy over this project was fierce. Opposition was violent. Those who liked the project adored it. Those who opposed it rejected it out of hand. So much so that some experts in traditional Lingnan gardens even insulted Dr. Yu, calling him a traitor to the world of traditional gardens. It should be pointed out that the Shipyard Park project was decided by the citizens. Appealing for public participation was a first in China. During the adoption phase of this project, the former workers from the Yuezhong shipyard were the main supporters. They came of their own accord to the planning department to say that they supported Dr. Yu's project. 
The workers felt that this project embodied their glory and their past mission. For example, this boat on which we're standing is the last one built by the Yuezhong shipyard. That's why we've decided to keep it as a souvenir, to leave a souvenir for the former workers. It's true that they have gone, but the boat that they made is still here. In modern-day China, where urbanization is all the rage, there really is a lack of talents like Dr. Yu. I want to cover the everyday culture, normal people, yeah, vernacular. This park is the first free park, designed as a free park, no fences. It's uh, freedom. So when you see, look at uh, the green box, I try, try to create a space for, for, for people to kiss, to make love here. Because when you look at this Chinese uh, street, at that time, I didn't feel any privacy. So in this park, I try to create actually very private space. People perform in this park. People certainly become a daily experience. So this park is open theater. This park is not only a visual performance, it's also a technical feat. This garden, which lives with the floods, has been laid out in tiers between a network of bridges and terraced plantations. It's thus the first example of a concept devised by Dr. Yu, that of Sponge City, whose green spaces can absorb the floods and heavy rains. It's a principle he hopes to extend to all of China. After three decades of concreting, the country's rigid pipes could crack at the slightest sign of water, thus submerging the major metropolises. Natural disasters that Dr. Yu's softly, softly ecological approach would avoid. The design strategy, we want to create a terraces. Water will be fluctuate, will go up. Water can go up all the way to here. And between these fluctuations, you can grow different uh, plants. Here you can grow lotus, for example. Here you can grow grass, which become feed for fish. Here you will see areas. Underneath, you will have uh, submerged wet plants. Oh. Instead of concrete wall, flat wall, we invented these terraces. These uh, terraces allow flood to come in and allow people to go to the water. This green sponge idea can also solve the problem of flood, of urban inundation. I'm not just an architect. Uh, I'm uh, more like a thinker about how we can make landscape sustainable? How can we find the solutions that deal with these big issues of air pollution, energy consumption, food production, water management? So all this will become the focus 
of this profession as a landscape architect. That's why I call the profession as an art of survival. <laughs>